Excellent. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me here and for coming. This is great to be here and uh, with all the all the colleagues and seeing all the great work that's being done. I'm going to talk about scaling vectors. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm Eric Lawyer. I'm the creative director of both uh, the Vectors Journal and the Scalar Project. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how one turned into the other, how Vectors kind of turned into Scalar, because I think there's a lot of issues that came up through that process that might be instructive to hear about. Um, I will be talking principally about Scalar, which if you hadn't heard about it, um, a tool that went into public beta this year from the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture. Um, supported by the Mellon Foundation, um, a tool for basically uh, multimodal scholarly authoring. lets you uh, bring in media from a variety of sources, whether from archives or your own media or other places online, integrate that with your own writing, and take advantage of some of the unique kind of structural capabilities of digital composition. Um, but what I want to do is, as I said, take a look at Scalar in a little bit of context, a little bit of historical context, which is as the evolution of an earlier project um, called Vectors. So Vectors was an experimental um, digital humanities journal, although at the time it was founded in 2005, digital humanities was not quite yet a term that was used a lot. Um, and basically it had this uh, format, it was a very luxurious format that involved uh, on a fellowship model, having scholars and uh, interactive designers collaborate, usually on the order of about six months or so, on individual projects that were then published in the journal. Um, the journal had a, you know, a volume and issue format. We've actually just recently changed that format. Now it's going to be kind of a more rolling, intermittent publication. And you are welcome to submit completed projects um, to Vectors, um, even now. Um, but really talking about that original model, these collaborations between interactive designers and scholars, it was not a model that was very scalable. Um, having a designer and a scholar work together for six months um, is just not something that's going to happen all over the place um, that easily. So even the name of Scalar itself was really kind of about how do we address this? How do we take the things that we've learned from vectors, abstract them out into something that's more generally applicable? Um, and Scalar being a mathematical term, that which scales vectors is our, our little inside joke about the name. So the primary kind of piece of technology that enabled vectors was something called the DBG, the Dynamic Background Backend Generator that was developed by Craig Dietrich. And really what it did was to make it easy for us to design and reshape and create and populate databases, relational databases. Um, by making that process easy, by making it easy to remodel and reshape and redesign the content that was going into these vectors projects, it enables us to explore how to make the design of the database enact the argument the scholar wanted to make. So these databases weren't just about how do we organize content for publication, um, but really about how do we make the shape of that content, the form of it, the way in which individual pieces of content connect to each other and enact the arguments that, that are going on for the scholar. Um, we found that as a process, many scholars found this experience of writing in this way um, pretty transformative. And in some cases, they didn't want to go back to, to the ways that they had been writing before. But how do we enable scholars to do this on their own. Again, this is always a collaborative process between a designer and a scholar or a developer and a scholar. How do we enable um, engagement with this to happen more on an individual basis so that it can be spread more widely? So, you know, as many of you know, in a <clears throat> relational database, the kind of basic unit of content is the row. Um, and while this works well for this kind of project, it still was pretty alien as a format for the way scholars were, were composing their work. Um, while you might be working with databases and rows and columns in your research, as far as a way of composing your writing, um, still in many cases felt to most people pretty alien. And in, <clears throat> excuse me, in many cases in Vectors projects, we found that there would be this kind of crisis moment that occurred where um, the whole process was kind of so alien and so unfamiliar um, you know, why are you taking my writing and kind of dissecting it into these little atomic digital boxes? How am I supposed to create something out of that? That there was this moment that was kind of a crisis of basically having to choose to go with the medium and see where the design and the development was going to lead you, um, even though you didn't quite know if it was going to work out. And so as interactive designers and developers, we were, you know, kind of saying, it's going to be okay, come on, it's going to work out. Um, but it was a very anxiety-producing moment, and it happened somewhat, somewhat frequently on Vector's projects. So in thinking about how to take this you know, more kind of alien way of working that feels like working in a spreadsheet and turn it into something that feels more familiar and there may be more accessible, 
really started, you know, as many folks are thinking of the book, what happens is the book becomes a database. So we were working with relational databases in, you know, rows and columns. Um, how does that get translated into something that's a little bit easier and more accessible to compose for? And so instead of the basic unit being the row, it became the page in Scalar, um, just like it is on the web. So a page is really just a, a representation of a digital object in your Scalar project. Um, it became, you know, it's, it's a piece of writing, it's a piece of media, maybe it's a collection of things, um, but we call it a page. And that's one of the key learnings that we found creating Scalar was that familiar terminology actually served us very well. Um, when we were originally designing Scalar, we called pages composites because they were kind of mixtures of text and media. Um, and as soon as we started trying to go out and talk about uh, Scalar and what it could do in this terminology, it just kind of got stuck in our throats and it was really hard to, to talk about. And we said, you know, we're just going to call these things books and pages, um, the way people traditionally refer to them. Um, and we did get some pushback. You know, we would present Scalar in a, in a talk or a meeting and people would say, why are you calling these things books? Um, aren't you kind of shackling yourself to these older forms? And our experience has been quite the opposite that Familiar technology is really just kind of the bridge. Um, and as soon as people start using the technology, they realize, well, of course, this isn't like a traditional book. There's things that you can do that are, that are completely unlike what a traditional book can do. And they just accept that and move on. Um, and, and the terminology being familiar really just helped ease that process through. And we don't get a lot of, a lot of uh, pushback on that these days. But the database isn't just a collection of items. It's not just an inventory. It's relationships between items. And how are we going to codify those? That was one of the questions that we, that we face in terms of making this practice more accessible. This actually turned out to be one of the easier solutions um, in that as long as we provided ways to make sequences of things, to create nonlinear groupings of things, and then to enable those structures to be mixed and matched, and combined, we found that we pretty much could achieve most of what scholars came to us wanting in terms of the structure of their books. As long as you can sequence things, group things, and then intermingle those structures together, that seemed to satisfy most of what was, what was being asked for. And so the result was this, this tool, Scalar. Um, this is a, a look at, this is the user's guide. Um, and again, it was deliberately designed to feel a little bit like blogging, a little bit like uh, traditional kind of image text relationships. Um, and so there's something you know, satisfying about using a kind of blogging platform or something that feels a little bit like a blogging platform to construct a, a publication. But the question of design was one that really kind of has continued to be a challenge um, all the way along. Um, we're writing scholarly articles which already have a kind of history of design kind of look and feel. Um, but then we also had a history of projects and vectors that tended to look more like this. And so when you go from things that look like this to things that look like this, um, there's a question that comes up. In one of our very first uh, Scalar presentations or workshops, someone asked, what happened to the pretty? <laughs> um, very legitimate question. Um, one of the things that was difficult to communicate, and we probably could have done a better job communicating, which is that the, the real transition that we were trying to make happen was not from this to this, but more from this to this, okay? So the authoring environment for these kind of projects was basically what looked like an Excel spreadsheet um, for editing the database. And it was something that required this uh, collaboration of designer and developer, or designer and scholar, sorry, to make happen. And so to transition this process to something that looked more like blogging, looked a little bit more familiar in the vernacular of, of online authoring, um, was really kind of the, the transition we were trying to, to engineer. Um, and you know, have, have seen that be largely successful in that we don't hear about these kind of crisis moments that we had with Vectors projects, um, uh, where people are kind of having this existential moment of do I want to do this project or not. Um, it really it seems to be a more natural process for scholars to kind of go in, start working with this environment um, and creating in it. Um, but design still continues to be a challenge in a lot of ways, largely because obviously our own expectations of digital design are very high. The, the, the bar has been set very high. And we found that the, the appetite to customize one's vectors or one's scalar project um, in the look and feel and the design was voracious. Our very first workshop, that was 
almost what all of the questions were about. How do I change the look and feel? How do I customize it? And so um, during that very first workshop, we implemented custom CSS um, within Scalar. So you can basically add arbitrary CSS to your project. Um, it can roll through uh, your publication in a kind of tiered hierarchy-like way. Um, and also custom backgrounds, um, a la Twitter. Um, and really just kind of implemented this on the fly in response to what we were hearing from authors, that we want some more control over how these things look. Um, and so here's some examples of uh, various customizations that were done um, in CSS and with the custom backgrounds. Um, we also published within the user's guide um, a set of guidelines for customizing your book in CSS um, and how to kind of achieve different looks, the uh, similar kind of common customizations that people are wanting to do. There is a, a, a downside to this in that the more customization you do, um, especially given that Scalar is still in beta, the more kind of fragile your book can become. So changes that we make to the platform might break your customization and require you to, to kind of revamp it or rework it. And so really we're kind of struggling with how to enable customization on the level of design in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's impactful, but that doesn't make the piece fragile um, and that still kind of achieves that, that, that level of visual flair that folks are interested in. And really started taking our cues from work that was happening out there in the world already, um, looking at things like you know, the, the Snowfall piece in the New York Times, other online publications that are using uh, media and text in some creative ways. And really you know, realizing that one of the important things is to start letting the media itself, which has already probably gone through a visual design process of its own as it's being created, to help shape the overall look and feel of a project. Um, so we're currently in development on a new interface, a new front-end interface for Scalar that we're hoping to roll out by the end of the year. This is the first pilot project that's been done for that interface um, by Jackie Wernemont and her team. Um, and you can see one of the things that we're learning here is putting media, letting the media kind of shape the conversation um, in some of these cases. This is a new view that's a splash type view. Um, but really trying to make the, trying to, all, for one, make pages themselves more streamlined, make the reading experience a little bit more streamlined and clean, but also letting the media kind of come more to the fore within the grids that have been set up and letting it kind of, you know, shape the conversation. Um, another element here is to recognize the kind of inherent aesthetics of the, uh, maybe not inherent aesthetics, but aesthetics that can be pulled from the structures that people are creating in Scalar books and capitalizing on those. So um, one of the issues that we ran into a lot with Scalar projects, partially because we didn't quite know what people were going to make with it when the tool was originally designed, is navigation and how do you know where you are, how do you find your way through a book. Um, so one of the things that's coming in this new interface is uh, a built-in visualization that's in the background of every page that tries to show you where you are in relationship to the things that you're locally adjacent to in the book. Um, still in development, but trying to also aestheticize the look of this particular visualization in a way that's distinct, in a way that calls out the unique properties of um, these texts and how they're structured. Um, other elements like, you know, media galleries, um, views that show you a piece of media and then show all the places where it's been used, basically quoting all the places where it's been cited in the book. All these are elements that we're working on uh, and really kind of in progress and welcoming feedback as to how to make these projects more navigable, more understandable, more useful, more, um, more, more effective. So the last point I'll kind of hit on today is something that we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis collaboration and transdisciplinarity that, that's pretty interesting to us, and that's people becoming increasingly interested in using Scalar as a kind of transmedia scaffolding. Um, so let's say you have a project or a set of content that you think could be realized in a number of different platforms, in a number of different venues, um, but you don't have your funding yet. Um, a lot of folks spanning the range from scholars to artists to documentary filmmakers have been expressing interest in using Scalar as a scaffold, as a place to build the structures, um, import the media, build these uh, kind of basic versions of their content, let's say a prototype, um, in, in something that takes the form of an online publication, which they can then use to pitch um, for more funding or for other types of projects, or even to actually drive the data using Scalar's API. So the API allows you to basically pull content from a Scalar book and use it to 
uh, uh, power a custom interface. So that's what these images are examples of. These are three different projects um, that uh, are using the API from a scalar project that was built uh, as a kind of scaffold and then used to drive other interfaces or other modes, um, other channels. Um, the knotted line does this pretty explicitly in that there's a pedagogical uh, component to the project that is primarily text and media, but there's also a, a very tactile interface um, that lets you play with that same content but in a totally different form. Um, another project called Freedom's Ring, which is about uh, the I Have a Dream speech on the 50th anniversary, um, also driven by Scalar, but uh, basically an illustrated vertically scrolling mural that, that goes along with the entire length of the speech but also has its own kind of pedagogical materials as well that, that annotate the speech. Um, or Inside the Distance from Sharon Daniel, which uh, hopefully she'll talk a little bit about today. Um, again, a project that was built in Scalar as a kind of scaffold, including a description of how the interface should work, and then the, the custom interface was developed out of that. Um, so these are areas where we're seeing a lot of interesting possibilities for collaboration that we hadn't really quite anticipated, and we're trying to learn from um, what the needs are of those different constituencies as we go. Thank you.